I'm Simul Kerr, and I'm really pleased to be with Westport Police Chief Fodi Koskinas to talk about everything going on in the world these days, quite a lot. Chief, thank you so much for sitting down with me for a little while. Thank you. Good morning. So it's been a difficult time uh, in our country. Obviously, the police have been in the middle of a, a lot of tough conversations uh, around the country over the last couple of weeks. I want to start by asking you, what, what was your reaction when you first saw that video in Minneapolis, as someone who spent their career in law enforcement, what went through your mind watching that video? It, it, it's even harder looking back now from when I saw it the first day. I mean, it, it, I understand what the question is, but it was a, it was a level of disbelief because we're, so, we're under such scrutiny all the time. So first of all, the mindset, forget being somebody in uniform and there to protect, but additionally on the human side, I, Everything we're taught as we grow up is if somebody can't breathe, whether they're choking at a restaurant or whatever, it's your first response is to help. Yes. What can I do to make sure that person can breathe? It's the first thing that comes to mind. So as much as the police and the patch and the badge and the gun belt, everything resonates with me because that's what I've done for my adult life, the human side kicks in and it's, you start asking, how can you not respond, especially for somebody who's in handcuffs and clearly no longer a threat? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's what made it. And then you look at the action of one and the inaction of three. And that brings you to a completely different level, because mm -hmm. where is the culture, not only the organization, but of that group of people that have the mindset to be not thinking of what is the next step? I'm even a little more dumbfounded that if you're not a human, you're not even concerned for liability. You're not even concerned. I mean, where is your mindset that, mm. that you've pushed all that aside? Your mm -hmm. human emotions are pushed aside, but then your liability, your livelihood, I mean, what is going through somebody's mind, yeah. let alone for people, yep. to allow that to happen? Yeah. Have you spoken to your officers about what happened in that video and in, in that incident? I have. Actually, you know, we've shared videos and responses back and forth because it's hard under the conditions with COVID to meet yes. with everybody individually. And even though it doesn't seem between civilian and sworn employees, it's a, it's a pretty big place, you know. So to get one on one, I've tried to make every roll call, I've tried to do all those things and communicate. But the message is pretty clear that if you watch that video and you didn't have to make it to the ninth minute, you could have watched the first minute or the first thirty seconds. And if you thought any of those behaviors were just, you you, you shouldn't be working here. Mm -hmm. That's that's really the message that's been sent. Why do you think? these things happen around the country. I, I, we, we've obviously have seen this pattern of it, right? And so it's, it's, it's happening over and over and over again in different communities. Thank goodness, not here in Westport. But why do you think it does happen? First of all, we can't at any point say that there isn't racism, that there isn't uh, biases against people. As we find out in this incident, we're finding out that there was a, a relationship between the two in the past. So this particular incident, there's another other identifier that makes you think, how do we get here? Mm. But that relationship going back wasn't with the other three people. So it makes you think if those three people acknowledge that this is absolutely not right, whether they knew each other or not, that would be more the reason to speak up. Going back to your question, why does it happen? I, I think this us against them attitude is probably the hardest thing to overcome. I, when I started as the new chief four and a half years ago, and by no means did the last chief leave this place in a bad place. This mm -hmm. was not, not, not the case at all. He actually did a very good job and I worked side by side him for a long time. But until it's really your own, that's when you really see culture. And I still feel even though things weren't bad, the culture change and adjusting from the us against them, the guardian, going to a guardian rather than warrior mentality and understand that we're here to help, it, it is probably the biggest problem. I mean, mm. we gotta face it in a community like this, 95 to 97 percent what we do is serve maybe three percent comes down to protect that that three percent is huge and it's really important i mean and we saw it when we had that stabbing a few months back yes. you know officers responded from construction jobs officers responded from different areas we had somebody in custody within 20 minutes the case is going very well you know as far as protecting the woman protecting evidence gathering all that stuff so the the officers do a really good job when that happens but we need to shift back to serving right away. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a very small part of the job. How much harder do you think it is in a bigger city where protecting is a bigger part of that job? 
You know what? I, I think the protecting is instilled in us. I mean, that's sort of what you take the job for. Mm. I think most people are like, oh my God, this is grown up cops and robbers. When you're in your 20s, this is exciting. This is a great job. You get to give back to the community, but there's a little bit of adrenaline. There's a little bit you build into it. It's an exciting, fun job. As long as you do it well and don't people don't put people in harm's way. Mm-hmm. I've lived in this town for six years. Um, I'm pleased to say I've never had a single negative interaction with a police officer. Um, but, you know, people who look like me, um, whether they're in big towns or small, especially people, you know, younger than me, frankly, bigger than me, right, right. Um, you know, probably feel differently when they have a police interaction. What's your advice to someone, an African American young male, when it comes to dealing with police interactions. Right, if I can just, I think, I think it's a little important because it's specific to me, uh, and I know you're aware because we've discussed it in the past. I, I moved here when I was 10 years old, mm -hmm. from basically from the Westport of Athens, Greece, to Westport, Connecticut. So it was, I was very fortunate. Again, during that time, I didn't know a word of English, it was a huge adjustment moving here, but what I wanted to bring important was, I had never been around black people mm. until I moved to the United States. That, that part of Greece where I grew up was a very white community. It was at the time that people had not migrated in from other Eastern European countries and things like that. So I didn't even know. So for me, it was, it was an adjustment. Mm. But I think for somebody that had never been around to be able to make that adjustment and say, you know what, this isn't about biases, this isn't... But it, I bring that up because it was an adjustment culturally for me at yeah. a young age to be exposed to that. Now, going back to, to the question. But, you know, I want to stay on that for a yeah, second because course. it's a really good point, yeah. right? You're talking about the, the human nature that is formed when we're kids, right, and what we're exposed to right. as kids. And so how important do you think it is? It's almost an educational question, right? How important do you think it is for kids, whether they're going to grow up to be police officers or doctors or lawyers or business people to have that kind of exposure to different people so that some of those, maybe their fears, misunderstandings about who other people are, what they, what they represent, right, right, right. what sort of fears someone should have are sort of broken down at an early age. How, how important do you think well, that is? I think it's incredibly important. And I guess where it leads to what I started is the fact that it took a little bit of time but I was accepted. I mean, for a short time, I was the minority coming mm. in. I really was. Maybe I wasn't a minority by color, but I was the kid that couldn't speak English. I was mm. the kid sitting at the lunch table alone. I was, you know, it took a lot. So of you time. knew what it was like to be the I outsider. Did. I did, and it's very weird because I'm, I'm still friends with him, even though he could have done a little more with his life. There, there was an African American boy the same age that moved here from Brooklyn, the mm. exact same time I did, and he had the easiest time blending in he could break dance at the time he could sing he could so i would see this and i'd be like how how is this happening as a young child but over a short time i really was accepted by my my, my peers by my teachers people went completely out of their way to help yep. me yep. And, and bring me into the community now back to what you said that mm -hmm. could have been very different i could be a very different person today if the, all those people didn't work as hard to accept me and make me part of the community. Yeah. I don't think I would be the person I am if it wasn't for the way my family brought me up. I had two brothers and we had a, a third brother when, when we were living here. So there was a lot of things going on at home, a lot, you know, a lot of involvement. But I think if the community didn't accept me the same way, I think I'd be a very different person today. And so how does that experience, Chief, influence your job and the way you do it as police chief? You know, it has resonated before, but in conversation like this, it certainly does again when it comes up because I, I really don't have a choice. I have to look at people for who they are and put the skin color aside, put the personalities aside because everybody's watching me. Uh, everybody's wa It's the right thing to do, mm -hmm. but if I want culture change, I do have to lead from the top down mm -hmm. in, in this situation. Yeah. So my goal is if people see what I'm doing and the staff that I have here, I want them to believe in what I'm doing and ultimately follow that. So I say at any given time, 95% of the people here are doing their job well because they want to do it well, but they also don't want to disappoint me. There's a set mm -hmm. of rules. I think there will always be 5% that will always just do it to not get in trouble. Where we failed in the Minneapolis thing is if those, those people that we watched in that video, they weren't part of the 95 or 5 that I'm 
saying there exists. So clearly, mm -hmm. it was either 94 and 5 or 95 and 4. There's still that 1% that just don't care. They're going to do what yeah. they're doing. And yeah. That's what we saw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So going back to that question, uh, if you're talking to a young African-American kid yes. in Westport, in Norwalk, in Bridgeport, what would you advise them about how to deal with an interaction with the police? It's really hard on their life experiences right up to the point that I'm talking to them because depending how they were treated, how a parent was treated, how a grandparent was treated or a peer, there's already their minds made up in some ways. Mm, about so, the police. About, about the police. Mm -hmm. So part of it is really looking and trying to evaluate where they are on that spectrum because I think the work that I have to do to gain their trust is going to vary greatly based on their prior experiences. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a one answer for everybody. I, I don't think that would be fair to that person, to that individual, not knowing what they've been through, what they've experienced, and telling them, well, this is how it is. I would start with saying, look, respect is mutual. And we, we, we have to respect each other if, in order for this to work. I mean, mm -hmm. I can't, if I disrespect you in any way, we've gone two or three steps backwards. Mm -hmm. If you dis disrespect me in any way, now I'm on guard and on the defense, I'm certainly not going to treat you the same way. So the room for success is not there. So really, it does start off with a mutual respect and giving each individual a chance. Not everybody in uniform has the same mentality as those Minneapolis officers. Not everybody in uniform has the same mentality that I do. But my mentality should certainly be instilled in my officers, and they better be pretty close to it or we shouldn't be working here. Yeah, it's interesting. My my takeaway from this whole conversation, sure. which should be obvious, but I think too many people, especially right now, forget about it, right, is when you put that uniform on, you're bringing all of your experience, all of your human nature, right? right? Everything that's happened to you leading up to that moment is all going into that uniform with you. And so people need to think, yes, there's a human inside of there. Yes, right. there's a human on the other side of that police interaction as well. Right. Right. And the police, of course, have to respect that and they have to deal with that appropriately but the human side is at play on both sides of any of any interaction right and, and the other part of it because it's absolutely no time for excuses from police right now we have a lot of work ahead of us and it's not the time to pass the buck even when somebody mm -hmm. points something that may not seem reasonable at other times it's time to listen right now mm -hmm. i mean somebody years ago pointed out to me like you know there's a reason why the word listen and the word silent have the exact same letters. Could anybody say it's coincidence? Maybe, <laughs> maybe not. But this is the time for us to be silent. As long as nobody's getting hurt and nobody's doing something that they shouldn't be doing, it's really a time to continue listening. We're going to have our chance to speak. I realize there's a lot of different legislation being pushed. There's a lot of different things. But I think reasonableness will set in. It is time for change. It, we shouldn't even say it's not even fair to say it's time for change. We're late for change. Mm. We, we shouldn't. I mean, we can sit here and say, oh, because of this, it's time to change. If, if everybody had done their job well, we should have never gotten. Yeah. This. Yeah. Speaking of change, you're seeing all the cries out there about uh, defund the police. Right. That's been one of the big themes of this protest movement. What do you think about that? What's your reaction to that? And I know it's a tricky yeah, question no, for you no, to please, answer please, in your please, role. So looking at this, that saw me smirk and smile. I think it's probably one of the most unreasonable things on the way it's being talked about and the way it's being done. Because it, it, the simple thing is, and ultimately, I hope we're not pushing our officers, is for officers to not do anything. The officer that doesn't do anything rarely or ever gets in trouble. Mm -hmm. So we got to decide as a society, what do we want? Because there's so much that gets done. You know, and I understand it's being extreme, dismantled, defund, you know, things like that. Right. There are a lot but of different there's, there's takes gotta, on that. There's a lot of different takes, and there's got to be balance. Uh, a lot of that stuff that they're saying that we should take money from the police budget to give it to social services, to give it to mental health, we got to realize that our government, in one way or another, has cut those budgets down in social services, has cut down the mental health money. You know, when I started 20-some-odd years ago, we weren't dealing with... Um, with adults with autism or Asperger's. So there hasn't been a system in place to address those other than keep dumping. And I really, I want to emphasize, I didn't say it by accident, dumping all those things on the police. Yes. The expectation, you're going to do this, and you're going to do this, and you're going to do this. So you reach how much can you actually do and do it well. And the other part is, like you said, going back to human factors, they are human. They're bringing their life experiences to the table that they have worked, but they're also bringing what's going on in their life. You know, if anybody's gone through having a sick child or if anybody's a sick spouse or a parent and you go to work that day, 
you're probably not as effective and your mind's not in the right place mm -hmm. as other days when you go to work. Sure. Again, not to make excuses, but the same goes for that police officer. So you combine that day of somebody being tired, of a parent dying, or a spouse having breast cancer, a child who's ill, long-term illness, and the traumatic incident at work, and maybe we come to that boiling point. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we do a good enough job for officer wellness in keeping tabs. We do a great job when we hire officers, psychologicals, polygraph, all these evaluations. Psychologists have to like do an, like six and seven hour test are you, is your aptitude to be a police officer at the level it should be? Right. And then we sort of just drop it for the rest of your career. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it sounds like you, you definitely agree with the idea that too much is being put on the police. And Absolutely. so if that's the case, what should government do? Should, should some of these things be taken off the plate of police officers, like dealing with mental health emergencies or things like that. The problem with that is there isn't a mechanism in place, unless we're talking incredibly large sums of money. When you call 911, you either get police, fire, or EMS. Right. And those first 30 seconds to the 10 minutes till we de-escalate and get to the level that we get them to the hospital and they see a social worker and things like that, that's the most important part. So the other part is how can you get a well-trained social worker to respond in a timely manner that incident that we're talking about and at the same time make sure that that social worker is wor walking into a crisis and they're safe to do so mm -hmm. so when you're trying to do that balance i'm not really sure i don't have an answer yeah. how we get there yeah well it's been uh quite a time i, I want to thank you for everything I, I the last thing i'll ask you is i went to a, a rally out in jessica green and, and you spoke and, and you apologized I did. um nothing's happened in westport but you apologized to to, to George Floyd, to his family, oh, to okay. everyone. Why, why did you feel the need to so do that? You said that? I mean, it's the strangest thing, and it's by me, it's not the interview answer. I got goosebumps when you said it. I, I really mm -hmm. did. I feel so strongly about and wearing the uniform and wearing a badge. It doesn't matter what patches are on it or what shape the badge is. That guy represented everything I represent also. So to see that, it, it's embarrassing, it's horrifying, it's almost to the point that I will continue what I'm doing for a couple more years, so to speak. But you look back and you're like, what am I doing here? Mm -hmm. you, you really, you have a, a moment of like, almost like, you know, a catharsis of like, mm. where, where does this mean for me moving forward? If people that we have the same job and same responsibilities and they act la out like that, mm -hmm. you're still representing me. It doesn't matter that it was 2,000 miles away. It really yeah. it has no impact. Powerful. I get it. Chief, thank you so much. Really thank appreciate you. it. No, no, thank you for doing this. All right. Thanks for joining us.